Perfect. Thank you, Aaron. Okay. So as a reminder, we are recording this meeting. Uh, the plan is for us to actually post the entire recording after this meeting so that individuals that were not able to make it are able to listen in and follow along and see the different areas of uh, feedback opportunities that we will have throughout this whole process. Um, Aaron put in the chat for me. Thank you so much, Aaron. The link to the attendance form. This is the best way for us to know who is participating, who is able to join. It's just the best way for us to keep track of that. So if you could please fill out that attendance form, we would really, really appreciate that. All right, next slide, please. Okay, just want to go over a couple of little housekeeping items um, for folks, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, we are in a virtual space, and so if we don't stay muted when we are not speaking, things get a little chaotic, and it's really hard for other folks to hear. So if you are not speaking, please make sure you are muted. Please raise your hand um, so that we can call on you. As John mentioned, we are going to be doing a speaker's queue, but that way we can make sure we get to as many people as possible. This is really, really important for us to get feedback, and so I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to get it back from as many people as possible. Um, please use the chat box to answer to enter questions, or again, you can raise your hand when we get to those uh, various points. Please, please, please do not disclose any public or protected health information. Um, if any PHI is disclosed, we actually then cannot post this meeting, so that would be really unfortunate. Um, so please be very, very mindful to not disclose any PHI, public protected health information. I always say public, I don't know why. Protected health information. And then as we are going, the team is going to do their best to answer your questions um, within the uh, chat. I will answer questions as I am able. Um, we likely won't be able to get to everything. Please know that we are doing the best that we can, and you can certainly follow up with additional questions um, to that home health email inbox. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's get into what we are going to be talking about today, which is really exciting. Uh, we are starting this. So this is the first meeting that we are going to host over quite an extensive period of time to really work on the revision of the private duty nursing regulations. So this is something that we've been talking about for the past couple of months as we are going through the administrative approval process. And so we are starting that today, which is great. And so I'm so happy that we have so many of you joining us to help us through that. So here's uh, an outline of what that process is going to look like. So we have our meetings, we have to go through a process where we clear things to make sure that it meets all of the requirements from a legal perspective, from the federal perspective, all those things. We then will present the updated regulations to the Medical Services Board, um, and the board then you know, has an opportunity to adopt things, ask for changes, ask questions, all that good stuff. And then there, um, a couple of months after it is presented to the board, then they go into effect. Next slide, please. So really, here are our goals, right? Um, we are hoping to conduct a very thorough review and update of our regulations. Uh, this is something that we've been talking about. There's you know, areas here and there that need to be updated and changed. And so we're really hoping to go through that completely and totally um, with you all. We need your input. We need your guidance. We need your information so that we can make sure that these regulations fit uh, the benefit that we have. And so we are going to be working with you all to make sure the language is clear. We get rid of outdated language. We rephrase things where necessary. You know, really, truly just doing a complete overhaul where we can. Um, you know, we want to add relevant definitions to the rules. Um, you know, insert some best practices for PAR submission to clarify the process, things like that, to make sure that everything is very, very clear, which is our ultimate goal. Next slide, please. So here is a just a high level overview of kind of the outline of the rules themselves currently. And so you can just see from definitions all the way down to reimbursement. All of our regulations are found on the Colorado Secretary of State's website. There's your citation. Erin is doing a marvelous job of adding in all of the links for you all so you can click on them as necessary. But just a quick little overview of this is what the current outline of the rules is. Next slide, please. So as far as uh, the rules, so each meeting, what we are going to do moving forward is we're going to pick a section or go through a certain section of the rule 
to talk through and offer up some edits and hear your thoughts, hear your edits back to us about what needs to change, things like that. Um, so today we're focusing on a specific section around prior authorization procedures, really focusing in on the documentation requirements. We thought this was a really good place to start since we had been talking about this for quite some time. Um, later on, we'll review the remaining PAR components, which would include the description of the um, submission process and uh, information around the third party utilization management known as the UM contractor um, process. So those will come at, in future meetings, just so you all know. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So in general, so here are some like real high level things I need you all to be thinking about as we are going through this. As we are going through these rules and the suggestions and things like that, keep in mind, none of this is final. This is why we are here, is so that we can make these changes, right? And so as we are presenting information, we may get feedback from 30 people later on, it via email or phone call or whatever it is saying, hey, I think you should make this tweak or this tweak or that, and this makes more sense. So none of this information that we are presenting today is final. These are just suggestions, and we're really hoping for your feedback. Uh, we are going to be documenting all of your feedback, all of your ideas. Uh, we're going to have certain words that will change throughout. So for example, the word client will be updated to member, as that is the most updated person center uh, language that we use. And so, you know, things like that that are outdated, those will automatically be updated throughout the rule. Um, in some cases, we are actually going to be proposing to reorganize some sections that will help with making those sections clear and readable. And so some of it is just real, really about reorganizing some things, moving it from one section to another because it flows better, things like that. Um, we're going to add some definitions for common terms, spell out acronyms, things like that. Um, and we are very excited for your feedback and participation. All right, let's get into it. How's that sound? You guys are all very excited and a lively group today. Okay. So this is the prior authorization procedure. Oh, look at that. I love me some emojis. That's so fun. Thank you. Uh, uh, Kate, you have a question before we get started. Sorry, no question. Oh, just a thumbs up. See, she's just cheering me on. It's great. <laughs> okay. Um, so current state, this is what the process looks like. So we have our department PAR form. Uh, the plan of care or 485 form, and then the explanation of the PDN LPN use. And you can see we put it in a visual format just because sometimes it's easier to digest that way. And so it's not, the flow isn't super great. It's not super clear. And we're really hoping that we can kind of reorganize some sections so it is so much easier to follow. Um, so what we are hoping to do, again, just as a pr proposal and as a visual, we will go through all of this. Next slide, please. We're hoping to make it much easier to follow and flow. So, you know, the prior authorization request uh, must be submitted to the utilization review contractor, and there's three components. There's the plan of care 45, the PDN tool, and then the supplemental documentation to support those items. And so the goal here, as you can see, it, see, it looks much more streamlined, much more um, clear, things like that. So this is what we are hoping to get to. Next slide. All right, let's start with the first proposed change here that we are hoping for. Um, so the current rule is real short. It just says the home health agency shall submit the initial PAR to the URC prior to the start date of the PDN or of PDN. And what we're hoping to do is actually add a little bit more depth um, into a definition. Um, and so what I would like to do is I would like to pause after these suggested changes and see if folks have an initial reaction. Please keep in mind, I'm gonna provide a whole slew of information throughout this and then various ways that you can provide feedback after today's meeting as well. So this is not a one-time deal. Any questions? I see a couple of things coming through in the chat. This is John. If anyone wants to uh, respond to that and make a comment, you can type your name in the chat. If you would like to speak out loud, you can raise your hand in the webinar. Or if you're just on the phone, you can press star six to give me your name. Anybody? 
I see um, a couple of things in the chat. John, I'll go ahead and address while we're waiting to see if anybody raises their hand or adds their name to the queue in the chat. Very good. Um, so, Maureen, uh, this is actually a conversation around the regulations. We are not discussing the administrative approval today. Um, and then, let's see here, J.D. Robinson, 1963, has a very good question as to why the private duty nursing regulations are in the 8.500 section of the rules. Um, that's a good question. A lot of times it has to do with the availability of the space and where they are per the Secretary of State. And so um, we can work with the Attorney General's office to see if there, it makes sense to move them. Uh, there just may not be additional areas where they could go, but just making sure it's clear that it is just private duty nursing um, and separate from the home and community-based services rules. All right, I think John has a... We have a uh, hand up, uh, Pam R. Please go ahead, Pam. Claire, you're in the queue. Um, I'm just wondering how this compares to federal um, requirements as far as what, like, what you're doing moving forward. Are you going to be referencing specific regulations and comparing that to what you guys are doing here? So thank you for that. I know that's been brought up a couple of times where there's fed, you know federal requirements, but then nobody ever really references those. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pam. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So there are absolutely federal requirements. We don't typically reference federal requirements in our um, regulations here. Um, we have a state plan amendment to a SPA, which is our agreement with the Center for Medicare, Medicaid, and Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid Services backwards. Um, and that is where a lot of the federal requirements are, um, but we absolutely do make sure that they don't conflict with any of the federal rules or requirements. That's part of our research that we do going into it. We also have the Attorney General's Office that takes a look at those to make sure there's no conflict with both the federal rules and any other state statutes. So there is a lot of double checking and making sure that there's no conflict. Typically what happens with our regulations, and this goes for all of our benefits, quite frankly, is there's more detail in these regulations in this level to make sure that the benefit and the services and, the, you know, all the limitations and the eligibility and everything is much more clear and spelled out. And so there's just a lot more detail in this level versus what would be in the federal requirements. John? Okay, thank you, Claire. You're next in the queue and then Jennifer. Claire? Good morning. Good morning. Um, I just uh, would suggest that the department consider how that last sentence um, works with the rest of the regulations because um, right now we know that children are, you know, children can get the, are supposed to be getting the PDN services that they need. And until recently, adults were limited to 16 hours a day. Now they can get 23 hours a day. That leaves an hour of the day where there needs to be a family member who's available and willing to care for them or some other way to have that care met. So I'm not so sure that that last sentence really necessarily works in the context of the PDN reg right now because it's okay. not a 24-hour service. That's that's a good point. Uh, that's great feedback. Thank you so much for that. Really appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Jennifer, you're up next. All right, guys. Well, thanks for hosting us today. I just have a quick comment on the language for the proposed rule change um, or the proposed rule language. Um, prior authorization requ is required for all PDN services to review the utilization of services and assess the medical necessity of continuous nursing services. When I read that, I'm looking at 24-hour care. Um, continuous, the word is a little sketchy sometimes because some patients do require continuous nursing services where kids with trachs require continuous 24-hour care, but other kids may just require continued care, which is at four hours a day or eight hours a day. So the word continuous gets a little sticky sometimes. Thanks. Oh, I, I thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate that feedback. Um, and I think you bring up a good point and that's exactly what we're trying to do is continuous can mean various things. It could be 
over a continuous period of four hours. It could be over a continuous period of 18 hours. It could be over a continuous period of 24 hours. So it really is varied. And the goal there is to make sure that the time period that it is being requested for is that the nursing services are continuous during that time. So there is that ongoing nursing assessment, intervention, um, those pieces during that entire process. And so it's not right. once every two hours type of deal. Um, it's over a cert period, right? It's over, a, you know, you, you send in the prior authorization mm -hmm. request, you have your documentation. It may or may not be for continuous nursing services. It's for a certification period for continued care. Yes, and that would be a different service. And so if right. it is not continuous nursing services, it would be intermittent nursing to mm -hmm. continue those services, right? Mm -hmm. So in that that's the difference there. Um, if you have a suggestion to make that a little bit more clear, because I, I totally understand your point, but we're talking about, and I think maybe the difference continuous, here. Sorry, continuous to continued. When I read continuous nursing services or continuous care, assess the medical necessity mm -hmm. of continuous nursing services. Mm -hmm. Meaning ongoing throughout the entire shift. Okay. So not all kids with PDN have continuous care. Then they should not be receiving PDN services. So you're saying that all children who require 24-hour nursing care I mean, I don't know if anybody's being provided 24-hour nursing care. Yeah, and that, that is the definition of private duty nursing, is the continuous nature of the services. So uh, if it is not needed for it to be continuous, then there is a different nursing benefit that is available, and that is intermittent nursing. And that is for the intermittent needs of a nurse to go in and provide services. Mm -hmm. And so okay. if it's not continuous, then it should be submitted under intermittent, which is a different benefit. So that's not the benefit we're talking about today. So those rules are not being amended today. But there is another nursing benefit. It's just a different one than private duty nursing. So for children with private duty nursing, when we're sending in a PAR, we mm -hmm. are requesting hours that are in line with 24-hour care for each child on a waiver? or on, you know, home you're service. only requesting the hours that are necessary for that child. So if a child oh, has, there may not be 24 hours, Correct. it does not have to be 24 hours. If the child needs four hours, you would only submit a, a request for four. And hours. that's where sort of the, that language, the continuous care to me as a nurse, that's 24 hour care. If a child requires continuous care, they're pretty critical. They're pretty ill. Not all children who are receiving home health services require continuous care. Not all require 24 hours a day. Right. Um, it I is think, continued yeah. care. Their, their disability is not going away. The nursing services, the need is going to remain there. I would just change that word from continuous to continued. I Thank you for that feedback. Yeah. Um, we will yeah. certainly take a look at that. Thanks, uh, Candice. We have three people in the you who raised Great. their hands up for that we had a comment or a question in the chat i can read that if you like or you can um, I... wallet oh from katie wallet okay yeah. um okay so we are actually not discussing the timelines today um that is in a future session so yes we are going to address that within the rules but that is not part of the language that we are discussing today hope that helps katie Okay, thank you. Jennifer, you're up next. Or I beg your pardon, Pam. I am so sorry. Pam? Okay, so the, the continuous word, <clears throat> if we're writing rule language for PDN, mm -hmm. and you guys are trying to make it incredibly clear the difference between PDN and intermittent versus skilled nursing visits and CNA, and respite and you're trying to throw you know trying to separate all these things right wouldn't it just make sense to put the word private duty nursing in there you know, so you would say assess the medical necessity of pdn nursing services and then you define what that is versus what something else is somewhere yeah. else in the rule 
to make it incredibly clear and nobody then has to read between any lines. I see. Okay. See what I'm saying? Because yeah. then you have a definition. You have this is what PDN is. This is the criteria for PDN. This, this is what intermittent nursing is. And this is the criteria for that. So this particular language is specific to what a prior authorization request is for. Um, and are you suggesting that we define the service PDN right here as well? Well, right, because okay. the prior authorization you're referring to is one specific to PDN. This particular so then, section, yes. Yep. Right. So then if you okay. define PDN somewhere else and then you say just PDN, you remove all the confusion between what is continued versus continuous versus, do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, that's, I don't, that's just my, this is my suggestion to make it just very black and white. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you, Pam. I appreciate that feedback. Thank you. Um, this is John. So Sierra had her hand up, but it looks like she may have lowered it. And Aaron, I see your hand was up. Did you want to go next? I, just a quick um, point of clarification. Um, the definition section is in the beginning of the rule, and we're not actually looking at definitions right now. Um, but we are taking these suggestions for what needs a, a clear definition that might be missing currently. So thank you for all of this great feedback. OK, so Sierra, let us know if you're still in the queue. Um, Galia, please go ahead. Hi, I would, uh, this is Galia Spachowska, I'm an RN FNP and a parent RN for my son um, that is currently receiving PDN services. Um, I do want to raise um, a, a lot of concern over the word of continuous. Um, as an RN and FNP myself, continuous means 24-7. The majority of children re receiving pediatric home health services or PDN services um, receive them for an X amount of time. Yep. That wording needs to be taken out because then it restricts what the PAR is being um, applied to. And I really question the validity of the wording of that. If you are wanting to separate continuous, intermittent, or whatever it is mm -hmm. that you're trying to uh, change the regulation for, I'm I'm going to say that it should say PDN nursing services okay. rather than continuous because continuous is 24-7. Um, gotcha. I also have a question about why you had added on additional members in the home do not impact the individual member needs. Like, I don't understand what that means and what that pertains to as far as context. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can explain that as well, thank you. Sure. Um, first, thank you for that feedback. Um, what I'm hearing is that the word continuous has a much different uh, definition for nurses. So thank you so much, Galia. We will definitely take that back and take a look at that. Um, and it sounded like you agreed with Pam's suggestion of changing that word to PDN. So that's super helpful. Um, as far as the additional sentence at the end around the additional members in the home do not impact the individual member needs, is the reason why that was added is we have been seeing a lot of requests that are coming in saying we need this because of this other reason of another individual in the home. And so what we wanted to do was make sure it was really clear that every request has to be individualized and has to be surrounded for that individual's needs, not because of somebody else. And so that's that was the intent. Um, again, we are proposing language and are really appreciating all of this feedback so far. John, I'm guessing Galia one. wants to respond to that, if that's okay, if I call on her. Sure. Go ahead, Galia. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> I, I would urge you to not have that in context of a rule of regulations for mm -hmm. Colorado state law, um, mostly because there are no institutions or LTACs for pediatric home health services or children that require PDN services. Um, and to really put that on there would be restrictive to possibly having medical foster homes. Um, and it should not be worded in that language. Um, I, I, 
I really, really do not want to restrict or foster medical home environments because otherwise these children are stuck in the hospital inpatient. Um, and you're right, it shouldn't affect their PAR, but this is about PAR submission. And um, that should be uh, reworded um, and possibly put in a different place. Um, okay. But this is not an appropriate thing. And I, and I really, really worry about restricting access to medical foster homes, which are basically the only place for these children to be. Okay, that's super helpful. What we can do is we can look at rewording that. The goal here is to make sure that um, it's clear that these requests have to be individualized to that specific member's needs. And so we can certainly take a look at that and, you know, one, see if it's even the right space for that. And then two, um, how we can reword it. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay. Is, looks like yep. Looks like Thanks, we John. Have work right now. Okay. Did I lose you, John? I was just pointing out, it looks like no more raised hands, no more comments. Checking in with you I do about see that. one comment um, from Scott oh. in the chat, if it's okay if I address that. Yes, sure. Thanks. Um, so Scott, this is a private duty nursing benefit, which is separate and apart from the developmental disabilities waiver and separate from the home health uh, certified nurses assistance rules. So it is not addressed here. And that is not um, part of what we are discussing today. So, okay, next slide. Thank you, Cassie. All right, so the next, uh, oh, where'd you go? I think you skipped one. Can you go back one? Thank you, great. Okay, so the next one here, um, super simple change. What we are proposing is just updating the word from client to member. Um, so real basic. And again, this is um, around the length of the PAR. So an individual will be approved for up to six months for if they're brand new, um, because a lot of times when folks are brand new to receiving services, uh, things fluctuate and change a lot within six months. And so then after that, they may be approved for up to a year. Again, it's gonna depend upon the actual needs of the individual. And it looks like, John, we have one hand on this. Gal, you please go ahead. Um, I would really be careful about the wording that you have dependent on prognosis for improvement or recovery according to the medical criteria. If we're looking at, changing this rule for pediatric PDN services, the majority of our children do not have a prognosis of recovery. Um, the majority of our children have the diagnoses that they have. They will not get better. And according to federal EPSCT law, which is very, very specific, you're supposed to maintain the quality mm -hmm. of life. Um, and this is restricting the federal EPSCT law. Okay, so it certainly does not do that. Um, but two, I will say this actually isn't specific to just pediatrics. So this is the private duty nursing benefit as a whole. And so this is not specific to just pediatrics. So all pediatrics, all children are uh, subject to, and we in the department must follow EPSDT. So that absolutely does not negate that. And the whole goal of this is, you know, hopefully, individuals, some individuals will get better. We know that some people get better, which is a great thing. And so what the point here is, and again, this is what's currently there. And if there is a reason to make a change, we're happy to do so, of course. But uh, the whole point here is around the care around the prognosis, because a lot of people do have prognosis and do have improvement and recovery. And if, um, let's say, I'm trying to think of a good example where, uh, oftentimes it's like a six month recovery. We don't wanna authorize a PAR for a full year when really, according to all the medical criteria, only six months is what's necessary. So we would authorize it for six months. And then if it needs to be extended again, it's the agency's responsibility to resubmit the information, which is 100% allowable. So it's just one of those things that it's not an automatic one year, it's as necessary. Galia, it looks like you raised your hand again. Again, I'm going to say 
Oh. That this is not appropriate for children under the age of 18. It is in a, f a violation of federal EPSDT law um, in every uh, shape and form. And, you know, there's a huge difference <clears throat> between adult PDN and pediatric PDN. And I think that if this is what you choose to put under adults, then that is totally acceptable. But you cannot make it general to both populations. And I will give you a, a very simple example. Um, I myself spent 14 out of my 22 years um, in the emergency room. Um, I was also adjunct faculty at the CU College of Nursing for over a decade. I've taught nursing to students. And, you know, unfortunately now I'm also, you know, a nurse for my son. But uh, there's a huge difference. If you call a code on an adult, you call a code uh, like a code blue when they're dying on an adult when there's no pulse. On a child, it's with a heart rate of less than 60. And children do not have the same symptoms or criteria or medical criteria um, as adults do. And so I, I would tell you that this is in full vi violation of federal EPSDT law because it is trying to generalize adult criteria to pediatric criteria. Okay, that's super helpful, Galia. Um, I see actually a couple of suggestions about separating it out. I 100% agree that care for a child is obviously very different than care for an adult. So that is really great feedback uh, and we will certainly take that back. Um, I want to just remind folks that we have several more slides to get through um, and so if we can kind of go through the next one or two comments and then move on. Um, but that is really helpful feedback, Gail. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Colby, you're up next. Hi, right. um, I was just gonna suggest as far as the six months for the new member piece, mm -hmm. um, it could maybe be a little bit confusing like as a, as a provider, is it a new member to the agency? Is it a new member to the PDN benefit? Gotcha. Something like that. So maybe just, cause again, like you indicated that you know, PARs are um, assessed by the agencies and stuff, you know, every 60 days or, you know, more frequently as needed. It's just maybe mm -hmm. indicating that the PAR shall be approved for up to one year and kind of maybe get rid of the six month piece. So then that way, you know, agencies know that it could be and, and families would know that it could be up to a year, but depending upon the other criteria, the diagnoses, the medical, all that type of stuff, um, it could be less than that year. So okay. just a suggestion. That's helpful. Um, thank you, Colby, for that yep. suggestion. So Candace, we have a couple comments. I can read them out and then sounds like we need to move forward. But Scott's saying this seems to be limiting the PAR to one year if the individual does, doesn't does make progress at the end of that year. I see. And um, so the PARs are limited to a year. That is actually a federal requirement. We cannot um, authorize anything longer than a year. And so perhaps we need to add some clarifying language that it's not because the individual didn't make progress but just in general, that is, that's it. So that's helpful feedback, Scott, thank you. And Maureen is writing separate pediatric and adult in rules, please, criteria difference there. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Maureen, for that feedback. So we'll move forward. Next slide, please. Okay, so here is an area where we are trying to simplify and streamline the PAR request. So we, you have on the left here the language that currently exists in the rule. I'm not going to read it all to you because you don't really want to fall asleep this morning um, listening to my monotone voice. But uh, what we're hoping to do is update that section with what's on the right. Again, please provide feedback. It is super, super helpful. And the goal here is really to add in um, what we need from a documentation standpoint. And so Here's our proposed changes. What does everybody think? Give me a second to read through it. Jennifer likes it. That's great news. Thank you, Jennifer. So folks, you can type a comment in the chat if you um, don't want us to necessarily respond, but to hear what you're saying, you can type your name for the queue, raise your hand in the webinar as before. or unmute your phone, give me your name right now.
Okay. Just from this, for the sake of time, um, let's move on to the next one. Okay, so this one also is um, <clears throat> hoping to further clarify. So we took what was already in there and kind of broke it out a little bit more to make it a little bit easier to read, again, a little bit more clear, things like that. Um, and so that's really, it's the same information, it's just trying to help ensure that it's easier to follow and understand um, specifically for agencies. Because again, the PAR submission requirements and the documentation submission requirements are a requirement of each individual agency, not the family themselves. Yes, of course, they can reach out to the family and ask for information, but I just want to make sure that's clear. Um, thoughts and feedback on, thank you, Jennifer, on uh, this proposed change. You so any response to oops. that, you can get into the queue using the webinar, typing your name in the chat. Sorry, Candace, did I no, cut you off there? No, you're great. Uh, I appreciate that so much, John. Um, I was just going to say you guys have provided such valuable feedback thus far, so we really appreciate it. Looks like Pam, you're up next, and then after that, Karen. Um, when you say orders for all disciplines and treatments, now it's in a different part, but it very clearly states that when you submit a PAR for PDN, it should only include PDN and anything outside of that will be returned and not processed. So I feel like that's a little bit confusing when you're talking about, are you just, because you're combining disciplines, but this is specific to PDN. Yeah, so that's a good point. So how does that work? That's a really good point. A lot of times, um, part of the request is to support some of the other disciplines um, and so I think what we want to do here is maybe clarify my understanding is that orders for all disciplines is actually a requirement on the 485 um, but we can certainly look at that to make sure that that is clear thank you Pam for that feedback Okay, Karen, you're up next, then we'll get to Katie's comment, and then Gary. Karen, go ahead. Yeah, I had a comment on the previous screen, um, oh. on the previous slide, actually, um, which was uh, even just about the documents being uploaded all at the same time. I understand that that's very efficient, but if you have, you know, found that you're... Um, uh, if you found that your particular agency has not submitted something that you really need to support you and to support your child, mm -hmm. and you're actually moving against the parent and the child, you know, against that child and forcing them into a situation where they're going to have to, um, you know, uh, you know, we're going to get a letter of rejection and mm -hmm. all of that. And it's just going to extend the process and create more stress for the parents. And I'm just wondering if that is absolutely necessary, if you can have some kind of, um, I don't know, some other kind of rule within which time parents can submit something so that everything doesn't go into a big argument. You yeah, know, so Karen, that's a really great point. Um, and I hear you and, you know, you may have information that the agency just didn't submit, which is 100% not acceptable from the agency. And so uh, agencies are required to submit everything, like period, end of sentence. And if you have an agency that is not doing so, I will remind you that uh, you have a right to choose and to switch agencies. Um, and that if you have an agency that is not performing in a way that they should be, um, I would recommend that you as a parent switch agencies um, because you want to get with an agency that is going to support you and make sure that your child has all of the services that they need, which is literally their job. And so if somebody is not doing that, then I would highly encourage you to switch. Now, in a situation where we're kind of in the middle of it, if you uh, find out that they haven't submitted things and in lieu of getting things shut off, we can certainly work with you. You could reach out to us directly. Um, we have that home health inbox and we can kind of work with you to figure out how we can get that additional documentation. So this is not a, and now or never 
because there could be additional things that come in as more questions come in, or again, a parent has information that the agency didn't submit. So I wanna be clear that this is not a now or never, but this is a requirement for the agencies. They are required to submit the documentation. They are required to submit all of it and they need to do it upon the initial request. The other issues that we have down the line, we will have to handle outside of that. Sometimes it's not that the agency isn't doing it. Sometimes it's that, I mean, it can also be, I'm just thinking ahead. Mm -hmm. It can also be that there's just brand new information. Yes. Yes, and that and is so perfectly acceptable. It seems like there needs to be some sort of a grace period for people to get other stuff in. Um, and also, I don't know, maybe there's a way for, mm -hmm. I don't know at present if there's a way for the agencies and the parents to really see, uh, to share back and forth, you know, what actually gets to you guys. Is there some sort of forum, you know, in which we can get notification of what's come to you so that we can see it, you know, because mm -hmm. they may, the agency may think they've sent everything in, but right. then if the parent um, sees a file or, you know, sees that it's all gone in, then they can go, Oh, wait, did you do X, Y, and Z? It, it just would be safer and make the process feel more comfortable, I think, to the caregivers. Yeah. And somebody else made a comment in the, in the, in the uh, notifications that just came up about, it's not so easy to switch agencies. So that is, that is a truth as well. Yeah. Understood. Um, so those are really great questions and comments and feedback for us to think about. Um, I will say, you know, it is the agency's responsibility to communicate with the family, um, to make sure that they have all the information, that they are having those conversations with the families about what they are submitting. Um, so let me take that back with the group and see if there's another way that we can address that. I really appreciate that, Karen. Yeah. Yeah, I know my child had had new information. We had brand new information that came out in mm -hmm. that, but you know, it came out after um, information was sent to you guys. The file was sent to you guys. Fortunately, it came back, but it was very helpful for me to be able to go, oh, <gasps> you know, let's yep. get this and this and this in. You know, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. Next, next up, we have a question from Katie in the chat. It relates to slide 16, I believe. Um, could section A be separated into each requirement instead of having a long list with commas? Yeah, I mean, we can certainly look at that um, and see if that makes it easier for sure. Okay, thank you. And then next up is Brent, and then we'll go to Gallia. Yeah, thanks. Right. Yeah, thanks, John. And and my question is just trying to seek uh, clarity on the order and flow mm -hmm. of the uh, documentation that's required for a prior authorization. The way that I see it, a prior authorization, the spirit of a prior authorization is to get approval before you begin services. Mm -hmm. It's asking for a signed plan of care, which requires an admission and a start of care. So we have to start the care and having to admit the patient, start the care in order to provide the documentation that's being requested for prior authorization. So it's just hard for my mind to wrap, wrap, wrap my head around that process flow if we need to, we're starting care before we actually request prior authorization. So that's a great question. Um, Christine, do you wanna jump in and talk about the requirements for the 485 around a signed plan of care? Yes, so the signed plan of care, it doesn't have to be signed by the physician, but you can have a verbal order documented. Um, if you're admitting this person to um, the services of private duty nursing, um, you have a good idea of, you know, you've been out to the home, you've seen the referral yep. information, you've had that, that initial, you should you should know that this person qualifies for, as an agency, qualifies for private duty nursing at, at the criteria that is going to be set out. Um, there is a there is a 10 day um, from the start of care to when you have to have your information submitted. It's the same as our intermittent benefit. 
Um, it's the same timeline that we have currently, um, but we do need those orders and, and to have that. Um, it's, you know, it, we need to have those orders and that, that assessment done. So Karen, I, it, that yeah, makes sorry, sense. Brent, real quick. Um, yeah. Karen, could you please mute really quick um, just to make sure that we can hear? We're getting some feedback from you, your line. Thank you, Karen. Sorry, Brent, go ahead. No, that, that I mean, that makes, and that's, that's how it basically works now. It's just mm -hmm. the risk is on the provider, right? If we, mm -hmm. we think, if we assess the patient needs X amount of hours and the utilization reviewer says it doesn't, they, they, they need X amount of hours, which is lower, then obviously the risk is on the provider. And mm -hmm. it just, it, in order to get a true prior authorization, it seems like we should get the authorization for what we're approved for before we actually start providing the services. But it hasn't been that big of an issue before. Now, I don't expect it to be that big of an issue. It's just always puzzled me why a 485, a signed 485 is required for a prior authorization. For, yeah, for, understood. For Thank you, Brent. Aaron, did you want to jump in on that? Um, sure thing. So, uh, Candace, do you mind going back one slide or Cassie? I just want to point something out here. So we are actually adding or our recommended proposed ruling would just to add a documented verbal order as part of like the 485 or plan of care. So we do have that incorporated, um, that verbal order. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. This is John. Uh, Candace, let me just ask you to think about a time check here. We have a whole bunch of comments and things, but while you're doing that, let me uh, ask Edward to speak simply because we haven't heard from him yet, I believe. I know there's other people in the queue, but Edward, please go ahead. Hi, actually, this is Irina. For some reason, using my oh, husband's no. login, but it's okay. <laughs> so I uh, just joined in recently, so I apologize. But um, just one quick comment, more on the verbiage, you know, from the regulatory perspective. I've noticed that um, several times, you know, we mentioned about physician orders signed by physician, always the physician. But don't forget that uh, with some changes, you know, some of them that came up during the COVID, you know, flexibilities, but then became permanent. Uh, allowed practitioners such as nurse practitioner or physician assistant can also sign and certify physician um, home health orders. So I think it would be appropriate to change the verbiage to physician or allowed provider or allowed practitioner to accumulate that together as well. That's great feedback. Thank you very much, Irina. Thank you, guys. So Candace, let me take in with you. Do you want to continue with the list we have now? Do you? I know you mentioned time before. Do we need? Yeah, to move I would. What I would like is if you have a comment specific to this slide, if you could um, throw it in the chat, please, uh, so that we can make sure we get through all of our slides. Um, and again, there will be a lot of opportunities to provide specific feedback after this meeting as well. I just want to make sure we have a chance to get through all of these. So thank you, John. Okay, so let's go ahead. Thank you, Cassie. Okay. Um, so in the next section, uh, what we are proposing is actually to move this entire um, piece to a different part of the rule to make sure that it's clear, concise, and everything is streamlined. So pretty simple. We just want to move it. All right, next one here. Um, okay, so current rule language here, um, what we're looking to do is to, again, update language from client to member. There are no other proposed changes to this particular piece other than that. Any, okay, Cassie's moving us along. All right, next slide. Cause I think the, I think we have a few slides here that are gonna require quite a bit of information and uh, feedback. Okay, so this one here, um, again, we're looking to simplify and streamline the requests and so really want to make sure it's very clear that the completion of the PDN tool is required and that it reflects an assessment of the member within the certification span, so within the time period that you're requesting services, um, and that uh, the documentation submitted must actually support the score of the tool. So the information that you provide supports 
the tool score that you provided as well. So they match is what we're saying is making sure the information matches. Um, and then the description of the methods for delivering the care is needed. Um, so the idea here is we want to make sure that these 485s, these plans of care are very clear. The goal is that if another agency were to take over or another nurse needed to come in, they could pick up the 485 and understand what this individual needs. So that's, we want to make sure that's very clear. And we're hoping that this language helps clarify some of that. Any questions there? Oh, so Pam has a question, John. Pam, go ahead, please. When you say documentation submitted must support the score and the tool, are you talking about documentation separate from the assessment that's on the 485? So the, the summary or what, what does that refer to? It, it could be any of the documentation. So the 485 information, it could be the information in the documents and um, that support the tool and the score on the tool there could be supporting documentation that might be helpful um, that could support that so really it's any of the above okay because that tool is expansive of the entire sensory system right i mean it's it goes from how much does a client weigh to how do they eat to do they have issues with you know sight and sound are they verbal do you know what I'm saying? So uh -huh. like, it's a fairly, when you say documentation support, that's kind of, you know what I'm saying? It's a little bit vague. Are you going, are you planning on defining this supporting documentation somewhere? Because that could be, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, yeah, there's, yeah. there's so many points on that acuity tool. Like, do you have to support every single one of those points to get it's, points for it? Or yeah, like, what's the idea there? The goal is to support the score and so um and make sure the information matches right and so i will tell you that we have seen plenty of times where the information doesn't match which um is very concerning um and so the information should match we are actually going to go into um on the next couple of slides further into the documentation and what that looks like and so hopefully that will help but really it's if you receive a certain score do you have information that supports that? And it doesn't have to be, you know, literally every single question, but as a whole, you know, um, that information should be outlined in the 485 and things like that. Um, right. We have to be very so, careful because you don't want to get too granular. No, because it's no, individual, I, right? So, right. No, and I understand yeah. that. And I think that I asked this question to you at some point, and I don't remember when. Um, but talking about, you know, kids that have had, you know, PD in service for quite some time, right? Um, who, who's, you know, nursing service works for them and mm -hmm. they don't go to the doctor 300 times a month because, you know, yeah. they're getting the care that they need, right? Absolutely. And so, you know, I, you know, for instance, like we had a, wrote a letter of medical necessity and sat down with the acuity tool and went through every single piece of that acuity tool and made sure that it was included in that letter of medical necessity as it related to the child right mm -hmm. and that was yeah. kicked back as not appropriate documentation not supportive enough okay. because it wasn't all these visit notes and it wasn't well maybe they don't have all those visit notes because you know, we're communicating back and forth over the phone and we're, you know, we're not necessarily going in and creating a visit note every single time there's an issue, yeah. right? And so then that paper trail doesn't exist for these kids that this is how they've been cared for for years and years and years. I mean, years and years. And so there's a lot of, you know, within the Nursing Practice Act, it states that the doctor and the nurse determine the level of autonomy that the physician is comfortable with, right? Yep. So yep. if all of that's written into the orders of what a nurse can do without contacting the doctor or making an appointment, like then that documentation does not exist, but it does not mean that it's not happening. Okay. So right? why don't we, 
as we get as we move forward in some of the documentation slides, take a look at those and let's see how we can make sure that it is clear and you know all encompassing without getting too narrow. You know all of those pieces. So right. let's, let's take a look at that and see. I'm certain we're going to need some <laughs> tweaks on it. I'm certain of that. Right. And so if you could help us kind of provide some you know suggestions on the language, that would be super helpful. Okay. Thank you, Pam. I appreciate that. Dennis, we have a number of comments in the chat, and Aaron's responded to a couple. Okay. We have a question about sending proposed language ahead of time of these meetings, and I'm sure we'll address that at some point. Yeah, we can talk about that in next steps towards the end. And then I think we have maybe one more comment on this slide, and then we can move on. We have quite a few slides. Let's see, we Eric is asking, will we? I'm skipping some of the comments. Yeah. I'm just going to the questions. Will the language outlining the discretion of the use of the LPN exist in another section? Yes. Aaron and Christine are shaking their head yes. So the answer is yes. Erica, thank you. Galia has raised her hand. Galia, go ahead. Hi, this is Galia again. As an RN FNP, and I'm just going to say I started off as an LPN, and when we did have consistent PDN nursing coverage, like I haven't had a nurse in over two years um, because of the current nursing shortage and pandemic and everything, but, and I've also taught LPN level um, nursing curriculum in the state of Colorado. I think restricting LPN use in the pediatric home health services and outlining it this way is very, very restrictive. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it should be added into the regulation because there are no nurses out there. And the best nurse that I had was a little LPN from Russia that was with us for three and a half years until she retired. And so I, I really have huge concerns about putting this regulation in place the way that it's outlined, because sometimes that means no nurse at all. Um, and I just really worry about the language. Okay, so that is current language that we are proposing to move. And so when we get to that section, I think that would be super helpful because I agree with you. What we don't want to do, Galia, is we don't want to limit our... Uh, we, we don't want to limit our nurses. And if we have LPNs that can provide and do these services, we should absolutely not restrict them from that. So I completely agree with you. Um, so please, I'm really hopeful that you can come to our future meetings as well when we are discussing that. Um, but that is super helpful comments. Thank you so much. All right, let's move on to our next slide here. Okay, so uh, here is what is, again, on the left is what is currently in regulation, and on the right is what we're proposing. And so we are proposing to move um, the language here into 7D. So different section, different day. That's for our future selves, right? Um, today, we are hoping to add in this language around uh, information around clients or should be members admitted to PDN directly from the hospital. So someone who is receiving uh, PDN services directly as being discharged from the hospital, a copy of the transcribed verbal physician order can be substituted for a plan of care. So we do realize that there are um, a lot of individuals that actually go home straight from the hospital and they need PDN in order to do so. And Christine is gonna jump in and clarify whatever I said. No, I was just um, pointing back to Brent that this might be um, for those that are, are brand new to PDN, unsure, um, uh, of exact needs. Um, these are to help some of our kiddos that are um, in the hospital and mm -hmm. need services prior to leaving. Um, you know, these are kind of our our um, our safety net um, to get those kids new to PDN um, or adults after a, you know a, a life changing event um, out of the hospital. Um, and and help with speeding up that that par that authorization so this okay. kind of relates to what um trying to help with some of that risk um that the agencies do have to to take on exactly thank you christine for clarifying that um and then i see a comment from gallia around adding transfer of par for pdn under par submission rules that's a really great idea 
And so let us take a look at that. Um, I think it actually would be super helpful to add some of the new regulations around transferring a PARS. So thank you for that, Galia. Okay, let's go to the next one. I think the, these next two are gonna be meaty. Okay, so these are all new, um, not new requirements. Let me just be clear, new to the regulations. They are not currently spelled out in regulation. So we are proposing adding the documentation requirements to regulations. So here are a whole lot of things that we are suggesting um, into adding into regulations. What I would love to do is I'd love to hear from agencies around um, what they think about this. Is this difficult? Is it, yeah, great, this is stuff we already do, which most of you do, let's just be clear. Um, you know, how does this read? Is there anything that's unclear? Is there anything that doesn't make sense? And this is specific to documentation requirements. So folks, you can type your name in the chat, type your comment in, raise your hand in the webinar. So this is all information that we provided um, in our trainings to our, the agencies that we've been conducting over the past couple of months. Um, and again, these are more of like examples of types of documentation that could be utilized, but that, it might be helpful. Scott, please go ahead. So um, actually my name is uh, Tracy. I'm on my husband's um, iPad. So, um, I've been an LPN for uh, my son uh, for the past 12 years. And mm -hmm. one thing, uh, and he's he's a kiddo that's 24 seven um, trait um, since birth. So um, one concern that I have is the amount of documentation. When, um, when you're living 24 hours a day, seven days a week with your patient, um, you're not walking around with, you know, a notepad in your pocket documenting every single time you suction, every single time, um, you know, yeah. when did you start a G-tube feed? How long did it take you to do a G-tube feed? Um, my concern is, is one, it, it is um, over cumbersome. Um, and two, the other is, is um, since I have taken over providing the nursing care for my son and removed the outside nurses that were um, bringing in the communicable uh, um, illnesses from, from other clients or from hospital settings, um, my son has been healthier um, and has had less um, um, hospital stays. Um, and, and my fear is, is that um because of good nursing and and what we're doing at home um and keeping him at that good baseline that the lack of um those higher needs when he is sick when he does happen to have an episode that information will be used against him um, so it's almost like, well, if it's not being documented, then he doesn't need it. No, he does need it, but good nursing is keeping him from, from needing it all of the time. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, it does. And I hear you too around the documentation and really what we're, um, looking to get at here is there are requirements as a medical professional to document the services, right? Is it every single minute of the day? Nope. And so I hear you, like, how do we find that balance of, because we, you know, we have to be able to report out to the federal government. We have to show that these services are being provided and what level. And as a medical, a licensed medical professional, you know, regardless of whether you live with the individual or not, you're still required to maintain certain levels of documentation as, a, you know, as part of your license, right? And so how do we walk that line and have that balance? Because exactly to your point, what I don't want is for it to look like, because you've done such an excellent job and been able to maintain a healthy environment and it kept your child out of the hospital that then services aren't needed because that's not the case, right? It's because right. of the services. And how do we demonstrate that in a reasonable way? And so that's really the line that we're trying to walk. And so any suggestions you all have for us, we would really, really love because you're on the ground, you're doing it every single day. And so we need to understand what is reasonable Versus, you know, I mean, the other end there is no documentation, period. Well, that's obviously not what you're asking for, and that's not allowable. But 
you understand what I'm saying? Like, how do we find that middle ground? Um, well, and, and, and let's use this, like I'm getting a lot of pushback from the home health agency right now saying, we need to know every single time you suction, what time of day was it? What was the consistency? How did he tolerate it? Um, you know, was it clear? Was it cloudy? Um, you know, how did he recover from it? Did you need saline? Did you not need saline? Um, versus can we just simply say, did you maintain his airway? Did he maintain a safe airway? Is it an open airway? And was there anything abnormal? You know, like were the secretions abnormal during your shift? The, the, the amount of documentation, and I wonder if it's because the agencies are, are getting so scared of the PARs being, being denied that they're saying, we've got to provide all of this. We've got to show them you're suctioning that trait 10 times a day. Otherwise, mm -hmm. they're going to pull the PAR versus saying, I maintain the airway. It was safe and there was nothing abnormal to report, period. What is yeah, the I difference think, between the 10, the 10 times versus saying nothing abnormal, patient is at his baseline and the airway was maintained? I think the difference there is that the suctioning occurs, um, but I hear your point and let's, you know, and I don't, I want to make sure that we get to other comments and um, the other slides as well. I just, I, I, guess I, my point is, I just want you guys to take a realistic expectation yeah. of, of those of us with our feet on the ground that are doing the work mm -hmm. in for documentation, really realistic. If you were in the field and you were doing it, like, yeah, is and it, that's is what it we're looking for? That's exactly yes. what we're looking for, Tracy. And so I really appreciate that. So Thank you. if if you want, you know, we have this, if you wanted to like type something up and send us some suggestions or examples of things, I would love that. Um, but I also understand that there's only so many hours in the day, right? Um, so we did capture that. So that's exactly what we're looking for is what is real, what is reasonable um, by while still maintaining, you know, the licensure requirements, uh, you know, the federal requirements, those types of things. So that is super, super helpful. Um, I also see in the chat that Galia is suggesting taking out uh, examples entirely. Um, so, you know, I appreciate that feedback. Galia, do you have, a, you know, a suggestion maybe you could throw in the chat of ways that we can make sure it's clear kind of some ideas? Uh, you know, again, this is all up for discussion. So I appreciate your feedback. I'll turn it back over to John because he's much better at managing the queue than I am. So Candace, this is John. Thanks. Um, we have five hands raised in the queue and I would just ask stakeholders to be aware of time as you're speaking. We'd like to hear from all five of you and Candace, you stop us when you, we John, need to why don't we forward. do this? I have oh. another slide yeah. that is titled documentation requirements. Why don't we go to the next uh, slide that way folks, cause sure. I have a feeling that they're going to want to comment on both um okay and then that way we can kind of move the slides and allow uh, um, some comments on both of them very good great um okay so this is again just um another slide around some documentation requirements some examples to support the continuous nature um <clears throat> and i would john if you want to open it up to comments that would be great Sure, we'll start with Karen. And again, folks, if we can all be mindful of time, we can hear from as many as possible. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, I can make a very brief comment. Um, it, it was on the previous slide. I think it was uh, letter C. Uh huh. Um, yeah, frequency. Um, and and I agreed with the other person who was who was speaking about this all. So I, I just want to like applaud what she was saying about it, about the cumbersomeness of what we're trying to document. Gotcha. Um, I think you guys just need definitions of of what you expect from us because our poor agencies are trying to figure it out and we're trying to figure it out. And none of us know if we're presenting to you guys what we really need to support what our children need. That's it. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, Karen. So we'll go to Pam. And again, thanks everyone for being mindful of time. Pam? Let's see, are you with us, Pam? Sorry, I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> 
Um, on the so on the nursing notes, um, it's my understanding that thus far, Keepro has been asking for thirty days, which I think is is a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and I don't think they're reading 30 days, and it takes a long time to produce 30 days worth of notes and then put them in the system. That's, I, I don't personally have to do that, but I know how they have to pull them out, and it's very cumbersomely time-consuming. Um, but on top of that, there, when you're looking at nursing notes, I've worked for multiple different home health agencies. I've also worked in the hospital system, and there is no charting standard in home health. I, some companies want you charting every hour, some companies want you charting every two hours, some companies are, you know, th like there's no standard. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> when you say, what, what do we need to chart, what are we, you know, um, and like previous comments, you know, if I charted, the note, the, the narrative note, exactly the way that y'all are wanting us to chart it so that you can see this, this documentation, I would spend more time charting than I would taking care of my children. Yeah. And so, and, and furthermore, there's nowhere else in home health or in nursing that requires this amount of double and triple charting and not being able to chart by exception. Um, you know, in a hospital setting, there are standards. You know, you work in the ICU, you have to chart this many assessments per shift. And if your patient is restrained, you have to chart this amount of information every, you know, this many hours or every hour based on what type of restraint you're using. And it goes through and it tells you exactly what you're gonna chart for that. There's no massive, nursing narrative note that proves that you suctioned a patient, you know, 23 times in one shift. It's all by exception. And so it's very frustrating to have the standard be so much higher in a setting where you're doing so much more for your patient. Yeah. We're not in a setting where we're quick popping in and quick giving some meds and turning our patient once an hour. Right. And and charting that by exception, we're we're taking care of these kids twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. And that's what and Pam, and that's what I want to. That's exactly what we're trying to get at, right? Like this is a different setting, and so how do we get to? And what I'm looking for is, and I appreciate that you all think that this is excessive, <laughs> which is, you know, feedback, which is very appreciative. Um, but what is reasonable? But some of it, I mean, some of it, when you look at, when you look at a diagnosis, right, and you look at an order and it says, right, that the patient is continuously fed for 12 hours overnight, this type of formula at this mm -hmm. rate, right? And I say in my note that I started, you know, I, that I started it, right? Mm -hmm. And that it's running. And I document every hour, every couple of hours that it's running. Um, or at the end of my shift, I say patient tolerated feeds with, with no issue, right? Right. Like to me, when you look at that and you have a nurse reviewing this, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of common, like professional sense to say, yes, that patient was fed, right? Mm -hmm. And if the patient isn't having continuous hospitalizations for malnutrition, I think it's all safe to assume that the patient is getting his food. And it's not that we shouldn't have to say, yes, we're giving food, right? Or we're starting yeah. a feed or the feed is running and they're tolerating it. But this, how many MLs did you put in a bag and when did you clean the bag and when did you change the bag? And, you know, what rate was it running at? And what exact second did it stop? And, oh, my God, that doesn't match the exact number of MLs that he's supposed to get. Like, this is home health. And, you know, when I go to the hospital and the dietician says, well, what's their feeding schedule? I say, I make it 24 hours in advance and it runs at this rate on this schedule until it's gone. <laughs> right? Yeah, like That all makes and, sense. And he's, and and Pam, he's I'm getting it. You're off, but we're really running no, out of time. Um, and I, I hear you and I appreciate 
your feedback um, and what it sounds like is being asked for. And those are things that we are exactly trying to address so that it is clear for both the reviewer and for you all, right? Um, and not on every second of the day, but what is reasonable. Um, I do wanna jump ahead. I do know, um, I believe we have, um, Steve Cox wanted to make a comment and he is from the Department of Health. And so I thought it might be helpful for us to hear from him and then we can move to the next slides and then wrap up with any last minute. Um, questions. I know we have a lot of hands raised. I'm sorry, but we are absolutely running out of time. All right. So I'll make this as quick as I possibly can. So coming from the agency that's going to survey all of you, I can tell you I've been a nurse for 22 plus years. Um, I have run nursing floors. I have run nursing units and we need to document everything that we're doing. And here's why. The documentation is a story. That story tells what's going on in that client, that member, that patient's history of the care that we are providing. I mean, honestly, this is nursing 101, guys. This is documentation that needs to be done. And it does tell that story so that if something happens down the road and a provider, whether it's a physician, PA, nurse practitioner, has to care for this child in their setting, hospital, ICU, they have a picture of what went on over the past to see which may what may have caused whatever issue they're in the hospital for. So the documentation is really important. And I'll let you know, my surveyors are going to look for that documentation and they're going to look at, OK, if your child was hospitalized, why? What happened up to that moment which could have caused that? Because that documentation is very, very important. Thank you, Steve. You bet. So let's go to our next two slides here very quickly. Um, two more sections really quick, and then we'll go into our next steps. Okay, so here we have uh, the current okay. language on the uh, left. I'm sorry, Mackenzie, can you, can you mute your line? Thank you. Um, we have the current language on the left and then some proposed new language on the right. Again, it's about documentation, what needs to be submitted. Really the goal here is to make it clear that the documentation needs to be sufficient to demonstrate the care that is required for ongoing continuous nursing needs. So the idea is the documentation should be able to help paint the picture of what the child or adult needs. So this again is for children and adults. The language that is currently there around the URC language will be moved or is being suggested to be moved to 7.D um to kind of group it all together next slide please and then the last slide here and then we'll go into next steps um is talking about the submission timeline um and revision so what we just want to do is make sure it's very clear that if an individual has a change in condition uh and that could be that that individual needs additional hours or fewer hours it is the agency's responsibility to submit a PAR revision within five working days of the change. And so the agencies are required to actually submit a new prior authorization request or a revision to the prior authorization request for either an increase or a decrease in hours. The PAR should match the services being rendered. And I imagine we will have some feedback on the time frame there from some of our agencies, which would be helpful actually. Um, okay, so next slide here. We are so quickly running out of time. My apologies, but thank you all so much for this great feedback. Um, okay, so future engagement opportunities and meetings. So uh, we are actually going to be posting all of the documents and all of the recordings on our private duty nursing webpage that we have. Um, we have a lot of different ways that you can actually submit additional feedback. So please do, we are going to keep a log of all of it. Uh, it is so helpful. It is so helpful for you all to provide these examples. If you have specific language that you suggest, please provide that. It would be really, really great. Um, so you can do it with a Google form. You can do it in an email. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we would love to get your feedback. And the next slide is just a visual of that. If you could go to that one, please. Again, you can you can fax in um, your comments. You can write us a letter. Um, I don't get letters in the mail very often, so that might be kind of fun. Um, there's no snail mail anymore, right? 
um, there's again the Google form and then an email address on that. Um, I don't think I would love, you know, John, we have about four minutes and I don't think Chris Russell has had a chance to speak up yet. And, you know, in the spirit of hearing uh, a lot of different voices, I was wondering if Chris would be willing to share her comment in two minutes or less. <laughs> You're the best, Candace. Could we go back to the slide, John, that is the first slide on um, documentation? Slide 21. Thank you. Um, you're, re you're requesting details on combinations of technology dependence and comorbidities that necessitate need for continued skill nursing. Um, this is extremely reminiscent and stressful for me to look at because um, once again, it feels to me like there's a, a technology dependence criteria involved um, in PDN, which should not be the case with children. And on the next page, you have a, a, a number of other things, seizures, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. to, to document and give details on. Why could these not be combined where you're asking for details of medically, necess medical, medically necessary cares, including the need for technology, the need for this, the need for that, the need for the other thing, and put them all into one thing instead of separating out this technology dependence and comorbidities, which is old language that has been so contentious okay. and doesn't include all of the possibilities for what would make PDN medically necessary for a child. And that's a great suggestion. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Candace, for taking my, my hand. <laughs> of course. And we have a lot of comments in the chat as well. Um, and I promise we are capturing all of those. Um, and I wanna say, it looks like Katie is wondering about a process for documents, the feedback that we get that is shared publicly. We 100% will share it publicly. I will take a look at what the CMRD, which is the case management redesign uh, team has put together and we can take a look at perhaps doing something similar to that if it is effective, um, Katie, in your eyes. But I really appreciate you guys. I really appreciate, um, we can go to the last slide 28, Cassie. Um, but I really appreciate you guys showing up, providing this thoughtful feedback. It's so important. And again, these are all just proposals, right? And so we need your feedback. We need your words to make sure we get this right. Please continue to send your feedback to the home health inbox, to using that Google form that we created. Uh, all this will be online um, and we will continue to have these meetings. Uh, we are going to space them out every other month so that we have a, a way to gather the feedback and then also prepare for the next month's uh, presentation as well. Um, but thank you all so much for coming today for this incredible conversation, this incredible feedback. You are an amazing community and we are so grateful that you are here to help us as we rewrite this rule. All right, thank you all so much for coming today. And with that, I hope you have an excellent rest of your Thursday. Thank you.